Good morning, Shades Mountain, and happy Mother's Day. We're glad that you can be here with us. And uh, right before we go into the message, uh, let me give a little bit of an announcement about the Pastors Conference. Uh, you heard Josh talk about that and to know that we'll have close to 5,000 pastors and spouses coming in town for that day and a half conference. And it's going to take a lot of volunteers down to BJCC for us to be able to pull this off. But one of the things that we're looking for are shuttle drivers. Now you say, why do you need a shuttle and a van? driver. The reason is, is that we are going to shuttle volunteers to the BJCC and back. And so the parking down there could be difficult. So what we'll do is when you sign up for a time to volunteer, you just come to the church. We'll have people that will shuttle you back and forth. If you don't do well as a volunteer, we'll leave you there. So it's, it works out really good. You just pick, pick your spot. But uh, so go to the website, look for ways in which you can volunteer, but do know that we really do need some drivers and that's what you'll be doing. You're not going to the airport and back. You're just going from the BJC uh, back here and uh, just getting volunteers back and forth, okay? All right. Hey, today I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 31. Ah, the Proverbs 31 woman, yes. Uh, we're going to tackle this, Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, the book of Proverbs, it's interesting when you look at it uh, in the very first chapter, in chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 1, verse 10, the writer of Proverbs it says, my son, my son. So it is as if this book is being written uh, for his son. He, uh, he warns him against some things. Uh, he warns him against uh, prostitutes, and he warns him against adulteresses. And all throughout, he warns him to stay away from these folks. But then when you get to the very last chapter and you get to verse 10, it talks about who can find an excellent wife. And it's as if at this point in time that he now is looking and saying, now this is what you look for, the qualities in a wife. Now, it's a very interesting uh, uh, section of Scripture, verses 10 through 31. It's an acrostic that is built off of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 verses. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And each verse starts with a different letter. It would be if, if it was written in English, it would start with A, B, C, D, E, all the way to Z. So here in the Hebrew alphabet, it's just an amazing uh, piece of Scripture that has been written. And as this is written, it is to help this young man to know what to look for in a wife. And in fact, Jewish tradition says that on the Sabbath evening that the uh, husband would recite this to his family. And so as he's reciting this to his family, he is praising his wife, but at the same time, he's wanting his sons to listen to these qualities of a woman so that when he is looking to get married, this is the type of wife that he wants to marry. So it's, it's an amazing passage. Now, in the passage, we're given the glimpse of a wealthy, aristocratic woman who is a wife and a mother, one who diligently cares for her household, including her servants. She conducts business with merchants, real estate, and vineyards. She helps in the society in which she lives. And it'd be quite a task for any woman to emulate this pattern. Let's read it and let's go with it. Are you ready? Proverbs 31, starting in the 10th verse, and we'll read through 10 through 31. In verse 10, it says this, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She's seeks wool and flax, and she works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers the field and buys it, and with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. 
She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. I have read so many commentaries on this particular passage of Scripture. And these commentaries spend so much of their time discounting what the author is saying. They say it's idealized, it's not a blueprint, don't even try to live up to it, and on and on. Yes, when you read these, fat, these verses of Scripture, you think this would be impossible for anyone to live up to this standard. And in today's culture of protect my self-esteem and give me a trophy for participating, the natural reaction is to say that the bar is too high and it needs to be lowered. God forbid that we would have to stretch ourselves and get out of our comfort zones to do something beyond what we imagine that we could accomplish. Let's just stay with average and just see what that gets us. Personally, I disagree with that attitude. I say set the bar high. I say set it high. Young men, set the bar high for the woman that you will marry. Women, set the bar high to be that excellent woman, worthy to be praised by family, co-workers, and friends. Wives and mothers, set the bar high. Don't give in to our world and settle for average or less. So that's why we're going to talk today about setting the bar high. This woman, whom God praises and defines as excellent, some translations have of noble character, some translations have virtuous, and whose value is far above jewels, is shown to possess at least six characteristics or qualities. So what I want us to do is take these 22 verses, distill it down into six characteristics or qualities, and, uh, and let's set that bar high, okay? And this is something that can be for all women, and you're also going to see I got something for the men in here. You ready? Number one is this, devoted wife. Number one, devoted wife. Since this passage is written as an acrostic, I'm going to do an alliteration. Everything's going to start with D, so it's going to make it easy for us. Are you ready? First is devoted wife. Look in verse 11. Look what he says. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She is the one who has the confidence of her husband. She seeks his welfare, and she enhances his reputation. Her husband has full confidence in her in every area of life. He trusts her character, he trusts her fidelity, and he trusts her hard work. And there says that there's an abundance of good things that come into the home. Verse 12, look what it says in 12. It says, she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She does him good. That means she seeks his welfare and she enhances his reputation and she has confidence in him. What the Proverbs 31 wife, what she does, she builds her husband up. She's supportive, not critical. She builds up, not tears down. She encourages his dreams and his visions and doesn't throw cold water on every new idea or aspiration. Men, you need to understand, well, not men, women, you need to understand that men are not very complicated, all right? Uh, you make way too much of, of this uh, trying to figure us out. We're really not very um, complicated at all. If you take a Christian man he lives for an audience of two. Number one, to please Jesus Christ. And number two, to please his wife. That's it. If he can please the Lord and please his wife, he's a happy man. In fact, the Scripture says, let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Why does the Scripture say that? It's because that's what every man wants. Every man wants to be respected. And he can talk about those at work that may respect. He may talk about the buddies that he hangs around with. But the one he desires to respect most from is from his wife. And when you read this in this passage, it talks about she has his welfare. She does him good. She does not do him harm all the days of her life. She's a devoted wife. But it's interesting because you look at these verses, 10 through 31, it's all about the woman until you get to verse 23. And verse 23 is uh, the structural center of the, center of the poem, and it talks about 
the man. Look in verse 23. It says, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Her husband is known in the gates, and he sits among the elders of the land. The city gates is where the, el- is where the elders of the community would sit down and make their judicial decisions. And so this is a very prominent man. This is a very well-respected leader because he's sitting there in the gates. And it says, this woman, this is the kind of wife a married man needs in order to be successful in life. Because she is married to this guy who's sitting right here at the gates. He's well-respected. He's a great leader on that. He's respected not only account of his character, but because he's the husband of a woman who is also held in esteem throughout. And so there's the character of the husband and there's the character of the wife. Well, you start to take a look at this, and guys, when you look at this verse and you read through there, you realize this is a verse This whole section of Scripture was what a dad was telling his son about looking for a wife. And so, guys, when you look at this verse, and it shows what is important for you to pick a good wife, you say, that sounds good. I want you to see one more thing. I want you to also notice she picked a good man. She picked a hard worker. She picked a well-respected man. She picked a leader. She didn't pick the 20 or 30-something-year-old who's living in their parents' basement with no job playing video games all night and obsessing over his fantasy baseball league. The Scripture starts with an excellent wife who can find. Let me tell you this, guys, if you don't do anything with your life, you ain't going to find her. You're not going to find her. Here's a challenge for the men. You become the man in verse 23, and you have a better shot at the woman in verses 10 through 31. Okay? Amen? All right. More women than guys said that, so that's, uh, that's good. Guys, you got to get out of those video games and get a life. Here we go. Okay, number two, diligent partner. A diligent partner. A diligent partner. That means a hard working. Verses 13 through 19, just look at what it says here. This is what she does. She seeks wool and flax, and she works with willing hands. She's like the the ships of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. She rises up while it's still night. She provides food for her household, portions for her maidens. She considers a field, buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. Verse 22, she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. And then verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Now, you read through all of that, you say, well, how does that translate into today? This is how it would be translated in today's language. She gets up before dawn, she cooks breakfast, she makes lunch for the kids, and she makes sure of the drop-off and pick-up schedules for the kids and any after-school activities. She lays out the responsibilities for the cleaning service and the maid. She goes to the market, she buys wool, flax, and linen. She also buys the groceries for the week. She comes home and uh, goes into her sewing room. She makes clothes for the kids, a bedspread for the master bedroom, and linen garments and sashes to be sold. She dresses in her best business suit and goes downtown, sells her goods to the merchants, notices a piece of property for sale that she thinks would be a wise investment. So she takes her earnings from her sales, purchases the property, lays out plans to plant a vineyard. She comes home, cooks dinner, helps the kids with their homework, puts the kids to bed, spends some time with her husband, and when he goes to bed, she goes back into the sewing room to finish some more merchandise and crawls into bed after midnight. Oh, that's a Proverbs 31 woman right there, huh? <laughs> Some of you said, I need a second cup of coffee. Just even read through all, all of that. Now, you take all those things. I say a diligent partner, hardworking partner. I believe you can take for that and we can distill that down into just pick up six quick qualities right out of what does that mean to be a diligent partner. This is what I pulled from this lady. Number one, she puts needs before wants puts needs before wants. When you read those verses, what you discover is she took care of her family, she took care of the food, she took care of the clothes, she took care of of the needs. And so there was a priority there. She put her needs above the wants. Number two is this, self-sacrificing with correct priorities. Self-sacrificing with correct priorities. Self-sacrificing. 
She stayed up late, got up early. She was, she was making some sacrifices. She also had to make some sacrifices during the day because she understood what her priorities were. I've got to do what is right for my family. I've got to do what's right in my business obligations. I've got to do what's right with my husband. And somehow I'm going to balance all of these things. And somewhere I'm going to have to sacrifice. Now, this is where it's a balancing act. And those who have the most difficulty are those who are married, who have children, and also have a career and trying to balance all those. It's difficult. But what you pick up from what this, this lady did in the Proverbs 31 is she made an effort to have that balance. There had to be sacrifice. There were some uh, things that she did not do in order to make sure that the priorities got taken care of. And only you can make that call as to what it is. But she had her priorities, she put the needs before the wants, and she was willing to make sacrifice. You can't say yes to everything. Some things you just got to say no to. And good things. Because you only got 24 hours a day, and you've only got your family and, and career, or whatever the things there are that you have. But you just got to make some sacrifices, and you got to say some things no. Number three is this. She manages money well. She manages money well. For us, what that means is set a budget, live in a budget. Set a budget, live within your means. Manage your money well. The fourth thing, she was an industrious hard worker. She was an industrious hard worker. She didn't sit on the sofa eating Skittles. She was getting after it, all right? There was hard work there. Also, you got to have recharging time. I fully understand that. And so I'm not saying go off to on the edge, but it is she was industrious and was a hard worker. Number five, she had pride in her surroundings. She had pride in her surroundings. I get that from verse 27 when it says she looks well to the ways of her household. She looks well to the ways of her household. That means that um, she's involved in the household and she looks well to the ways of the household. This is where she lives. This is what she's going to take care of. There are two places that we live in today's society. We live in our houses and we live in our cars. And uh, I would suggest that take pride in your surroundings. You take pride of what's in your house and keep it clean, nice, neat, whatever. Take pride in it. I'd also be the same for your car. Uh, I have been in some people's car where it looked like a family of raccoons were living in it. And uh, uh, I, I, was picking, I was picking up wrappers there that had expiration dates that had already expired. How long has that been in there? So uh, this is just a great sermon. I don't, get to, I don't get to be invited to anyone's house, nor will you pick me up in your car anymore because you think the, the poor pastor uh, is going to judge me on that. Okay. Uh, only if the Spirit speaks. Okay, next. Uh, hey, you think that was good. What do you get to the last one? Uh, dresses appropriately. She dresses appropriately. You know, it says that she made her clothing of, it had fine linen and purple, and that's the one I'm not so much uh, dealing with, but really verse 25 says, strength and dignity are her clothing. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And I think that anytime you talk, you look at this, and in Proverbs 31, there's two things about clothing. It's occasion and age. Occasion and age. You just have the right outfit for the right occasion. It's not like, oh, I've got to get something real expensive. No, they're just right outfit for the, for the right occasion. And then on age, you dress age appropriate. You know, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 13 when it says, uh, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, uh, and, I, um, uh, and I rendered things uh, as, a, as a child. And it says, but when I became an adult, I put aside childish things. You could take that and turn it and say, when I was a teenager, uh, I thought like a teenager, and I t spoke like a teenager, and I dressed like a teenager. But when I became an adult, I put aside teenage things, and I dressed like an adult. Dress age appropriate. You take those six qualities. It says she is a diligent partner. But now look at the third. She is a dutiful servant to the needy and the poor. She is a dutiful servant. It's her duty. 
She's connected to this. She's committed to this. Servant to the needy and the poor. In verse 20, look what it says. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. When they use that phrase, open her hand, it's their palm. It's the palm of her hand. She reaches out her hand. She's there to help the needy. She's there to help the poor. Verse 19 said she used those hands to work hard. Then all of a sudden, verse 20, it says she's looking at people beyond herself that are in need, and she feels she needs to serve them. If you have this type of servant spirit to others, it will engender even a greater servant attitude to your husband and to your children. A dutiful servant to the needy and the poor. Number four, she was a dependable mother. A dependable mother. She was devoted to the needs of her family. Look what it says in verse 15. She rises while it is yet night and she provides food for the household. She said, food will be ready. I will be a dependable mother. Verse 21, it says, She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Now, you may have a, like a little footnote next to scarlet, and, uh, and that has been translated in some as scarlet, but uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, and in the Latin Vulgate, which is uh, Latin Old Testament, uh, they both take that word and use the word double, double, which it means they have double garments for worth, uh, for warmth. And so like when that blue northerner comes in and all of a sudden temperature drops so quick, she's not going to worry about it. You know why? Because she's ready. She's got double layers. She's already made them. They're set for it. And so she's dependable. She's a dependable mom. She's ready for whatever the situation is. She, she's got it here. And then verse 27, I just like it so well when it talks about that she looks well to the ways of her household. She looks well to the ways of her household. I've always believed that mothers have a hand on the pulse of the household. Mothers have a hand on the pulse of the household. They know what's going on in the household. If there's friction, they know it. They can pick up on it. Things are going good, they know it. That's how you pretty well test what's going on. They know. They know their kid, the kids well. They know their husband well. And they just know things are going on. And it says she looks well to the ways of her household. She's dependable. She's a dependable mom. Number five is this. Doctrinally oriented mother, woman, excuse me. A doctrinally oriented woman. She fears the Lord. A doctrinally oriented woman. When you get to the end of this, um, of this uh, section of Scripture, in verse 30, it says, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. A woman who fears the Lord. A woman who has an awe as to who God is. A woman who recognizes the holiness of God. A woman who understands the love and the mercy and the grace and the justice of God. When this woman fears God, he said, hey, that's one that needs to be, needs to be praised. And because she fears the Lord, what are some things we picked up on? Well, first of all, in verse 25, you see that she's not anxious about the future. Because she fears the Lord, she's not anxious about the future. In fact, verse 25, the way it says here that she laughs at it, and she laughs at the time to come. She's confident. She's done everything she can to prepare for the future, but then she realizes there are some things that are completely out of her control, but she's not going to worry about it because she fears the Lord who controls everything, who is a sovereign God. And so, for her, she's not anxious about the future because she fears the Lord. Number two, she is wise and gracious in her speech. Verse 26 says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Scripture says that for the Lord gives wisdom. Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord because she fears the Lord then God is the one that gives her this wisdom. And when she opens her mouth, she doesn't just give you wisdom, but she gives it with kindness. I mean, it says here, kindness is right there on her tongue. There's a sweetness there. There's a graciousness there in her speech because she fears the Lord. She's got both of these. She's got wisdom and she's got gracious speech. And then the third is that she lives not for herself but for others. She lives not for herself but for others. And you just pick that up throughout the Scripture. She's going to make sacrifices to take care of her family. She's going to make sacrifices so that she can be successful in the work that she's doing. She's going to be sacri- make sacrifices because she wants to be a, w- a good wife to her husband. And she's going to make sacrifices because she's going to give to the needy. And she's going to look out and see that there are others that are in difficult situations, and she wants to help them. 
Proverbs 31 woman. But the last thing is this, deserving to be praised. Deserving to be praised. Hey, you cover all those first five, you deserve to be praised. Amen? <laughs> deserving to be praised. Th 28 <clears throat> says this, her children rise up and call her blessed one day a year on Mother's Day. No, it says her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Her children, they rise up and they call her blessed. Her family acknowledges all the benefits they have from her. And as far as they are concerned, she's the greatest wife and the mother in the world. And what they do is they recognize, every mother says, I cannot wait till my children get old enough to where they recognize the things I've done for them, right? And the sacrifices that have been made. It would just be nice if they looked at you and said, hey, I really appreciated that. Well, the older we get, uh, we realize, wow, my mom really did do A, B, C over here. I know in, in, in the last number of years, I would sit down with my mom and I thanked her. I said, Mom, I just, I just want to thank you. I said, you chose to, to be at home. That was your choice. And you were going to pour into Carolyn and myself. I just thanked you every morning I woke up, you fixed me breakfast and got me out and got me off to school. I thank you that every day when I came home from school, you, you were there. And it just worked out great for us. And I greatly appreciated that. And there were sacrifices that she made. And I appreciate it. I also told her, I said, I'm really thankful that you didn't agree with Dad when his company wanted to move us to Chicago. And you said, no, I really appreciated that. Well, it's not that she didn't say no. She just told him, send us a postcard uh, because <laughs> cause she wasn't moving. Uh, she's the most cold-natured person I'd ever met, and uh, she was never going north of Atlanta. So uh, it was an easy call for her. It's just if Dad wanted to see his kids or not. So we didn't move. We stayed in Atlanta. What a great call. But these are decisions that people make, and you just, you just say, you are to be praised, and you are to thank me. And it says, and her husband praises her. Her husband praises her. And look what he says in verse 29. He says, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Hey, I'm not telling you that all these other women are, are just a bunch of deadbeats. Oh, no, a lot of them have done excellent, but you surpass them all. You're my incomparable wife and you excel them all. We need to praise our wives. And uh, one of my good friends, Fred Luter, is a pastor at um, Franklin Avenue in, in New Orleans, and uh, he always says this from the pulpit about his wife, but I called him the other day and left the message, and it was even on his voicemail. And he said, hey, Fred Luter here, sorry I'm not able to take your call. I said, if, if it's a Friday, I'm with my wife Elizabeth, the love of my life, the apple of my eye, my prime rib, my good thing. <laughs> Woo! Praising his wife. And he says that every time, whenever you talk to him. He said, How's you? Oh, my wife Elizabeth. Yeah, there she is. She's the love my life, apple my eye, my prime rib, my good thing. Always praising his wife. We should need to be praising. And when you get to the end, look what he says. He says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now, charm and beauty are not bad. He just they're inadequate reasons to marry a girl. He's telling the young man should first seek a woman who fears the Lord. And then whoever finds such a woman should make sure that her gifts and accomplishments do not go unappreciated. You find a good woman. You find one who fears the Lord, but then you let her know. And you never let her feel unappreciated. So when you read Proverbs 31, for ladies, this is quite a challenge. But I don't want you to shrink from it. Don't lower the bar and settle for average. Set the bar high. Be the woman who fears the Lord and the woman who is to be praised. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that as we can go through a passage of Scripture and we look at all these different qualities, it zeroes down to the one who fears the Lord. And Lord, I pray that each one of us today, male, female, old, young, that we will take to heart that phrase right there, the one that fears the Lord. And may we be in a position to where we recognize who you are, your holiness, and to operate in awe of you. And then we know from there we can build these other things into our lives. I pray that each one of us would be ones that would live our lives to bring honor and glory to you. 
and that whenever the accolades come to us and accolades from others, that we would take those and then send them up to you and give you the honor and the glory because it is only through you and your goodness that we're able to do the things that we do. And everything that we do is to bring honor and glory to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.